Thanks, Elizabeth. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I'll start by saying that my question about this case is about diagnosis, about actually, is this, uh, could this be endocrine? <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, it's that basic. So this is a 19 year old white male <clears throat> who um, is uninsured. He presented with his mom um, and he told me that he came in because for two months he's been having cold sweats randomly throughout the day. They um, <clears throat> can occur any time of day and last for a couple of hours. He doesn't notice them at night. Um, and, and I would say they don't happen at night, but um, he hasn't noticed them at night. He says if he takes a shower, they go away. He doesn't have any um, cardiac symptoms at the time. He says he feels lightheaded when he stands up, but that's always happened to him. That's nothing new and not particularly associated with the sweats. His mom says that when he lives with his parents, when this happens, he his hands look chalky, she said, and kind of blotchy. And they he said they feel clammy. Um, <clears throat> the rest of his body feels hot. He does not have any flushing. He has no headaches. Um, of note is that last year he had an episode when he was at a friend's house that looked like um, a seizure. And um, he, uh, he came to me after that and I referred him to neuro at WVU. He was cleared by neurology at an EEG and an evaluation. But when they saw him, they were concerned that he had a very low heart rate. And they said that if he had any recurrence of that episode that he that they would recommend a cardiac consult he has not had any recurrence of that episode which included um, i believe some shaking i don't know i haven't i haven't he passed out and i think was shaking i haven't looked back at that recently <clears throat> um, other than that episode he has no recent history of syncope um in private, he denied drug or alcohol use. I'm a, uh, um, yeah, so he, he denied drug or alcohol use. He's a healthy guy. Otherwise, he just has occasional allergies. Um, he also denied using <clears throat> any over-the-counter medications, except for maybe an occasional allergy medication. His physical really was normal. I didn't put his BMI up here. Um, I could, I just would like to look at that because he's a slim dude. Let me just, um, I have his chart running here in the background. His <clears throat> BMI is 19. His um, vitals were stable that day, BP of 120 over 60, pulse of 78, respirations. 14. Um, and really the rest of his exam, you could just scroll through it, Elizabeth, but uh, there was nothing remarkable on heart lung exam, nothing on belly exam, no masses, he had no edema. Um, his neuro exam was normal. And um, he, the day I saw him, he was also reporting some um, uh, chest pain that it was right-sided with movement. And it uh, he had he had broken his right arm <clears throat> about two or three months ago skiing and it, the pain started after that I really did not think the pain was related to this he was tender on his chest wall and um so I put that tenderness in there but I didn't think the chest pain was related at all to the history so you could scroll down actually down now to the um to the labs which I think were fine uh, maybe he had a slightly elevated um, T4 <clears throat> with a normal TSH. So I've just uh, decided to re repeat that. I'm not even sure why I got a magnesium, but it was very slightly elevated. A1C, CVC, CMP were all normal. Um, and so uh, my question is, well, besides what is this? <laughs> what could this be? Is the things that came to my mind as far as 
systems are endocrine, neuro, and cardiac. And um, to me, endocrine seemed <clears throat> most likely, but I'm just curious. It uh, seems sort of a strange isolated symptom, but persistent. And so any thoughts that you all have would be helpful. Uh, I should also say that he has no history of skin rashes, unusual skin rashes. Great, thank you so much. Yeah. That's... Oh, oh, one more thing. Before, before um, <clears throat> I have asked his mom to actually measure his temperature when he's having these sweats. He didn't, he, he they haven't measured his temperature. Uh, so I, so actually small possibility could be fever, but they, for some reason they hadn't checked him for t fever because I think it just seemed like sweating to him. Um, so that's pending. And I haven't heard from the mom I, that I asked them that a week ago to check his temperature. And I think if he were running fevers, I would know by now. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much. Does anybody have any clarifying questions? All right, it's open floor now. Hey, Jennifer, thanks for the case. So I, I feel like my thoughts from an endocrine perspective, you know, there's there's a lot of things that cause sweats, thousands of things actually. <laughs> um, you know, infections like you touched on, abscesses, infectious etiologies, HIV, tuberculosis, COVID. There's there's so many things that can cause sweats and fevers. Um, so my job as you know, to help you from an endocrine perspective, some of the typical things that we see that can cause sweats would be pheochromocytoma. So pheochromocytoma typically has like a triad. You typically can have facial flushing, headaches, sweating. It honestly doesn't sound like that's what you're presenting. It sounds like it's just sweating. Um, so I would have kind of a low threshold to think it was associated with a pheo. Um, we do plasma metanephrines if we're concerned about a FEO. I often get the question, do people have to be hypertensive to have a FEO? And no, they do not. There are um, rare types of FEOs, very rare. I've only seen one in, in my entire career since 2015 that's been a dopamine secreting FEO and that's actually led to hypotension. Um, so if you're really concerned about a FIO, which in this case, it just, it, he's not really meeting your typical triad, that would be one thing to consider. Um, other things that can cause it are uh, hypoglycemia. So you may want to ask him to check his uh, blood pressure and his blood sugar when he's experiencing sweats and have him keep a, a diary. And if he's truly having blood sugars less than 55, you may want to be concerned for um, hypoglycemia causing the sweats. And that would be um, the gold standard to kind of diagnose that is a 72 hour fast in the hospital. Um, <clears throat> but I would start with a finger stick. I would not start with the CGM. CGMs are not as accurate. They get put on people all the time. They alarm and they go low and people think that they have an insulinoma and hypoglycemia. It is not the best test in the outpatient setting to detect hypoglycemia. So just a plain old finger stick or meter. If these sweats are happening every single day, you could even have them come into your clinic and you could do the finger stick in the clinic or a BMP and get a serum glucose on him to rule out hypoglycemia. Serum glucose is the best way to look at a sugar. It's the most accurate. So insulinoma would be uh, another in the differential. Um, besides that, carcinoid syndrome causes sweats, but you're not giving me a lot of the additional history for carcinoid, which would be kind of like diarrhea, facial flushing. Um, if you do get a history of diarrhea from him, I don't know, you, you didn't, did, I may have missed it. Does he have diarrhea? You know, I did yeah, not so, ask. Yeah, so diarrhea with flushing is, is in line with kind of carcinoid syndrome. So you may want to ask him about that. And if, if he were to have that, we check um, a urine serotonin level. Serotonin is a byproduct that we can measure in the urine. 
if you do order serotonin, I'd be mindful of the fact that he has to kind of stop certain foods before we, we check serotonin that can raise the serotonin levels, um, like pineapples, a lot of fruit, like pineapple, avocado stuff. There's a full list that you can kind of see at LabCorp request of things that he should discontinue before if, if you were to go down that road. Another thing that we see in endocrine so, clinic is um, uh, acromegaly that causes sweats, usually sweats with like a foul odor. And things that you can ask him are, is his head size getting bigger? Is his ring size getting bigger? Is shoe size getting bigger? Um, is he at any jaw enlargement or jaw issues? So you may want to ask him those things as well. Um, uh, diabetes, I, I know, did you say his A1C looked okay? Yeah, it was fine yeah, so, for him. Yeah, and then his thyroid looked okay too. Um, I usually use just the TSH. It's the most sensitive way to detect hyper hypothyroidism. The uh, T4 isn't as good of a marker, especially like the free T4. It's more, more volatile of an assay. So I think the fact that his TSH looked okay, you know, rules out hyper or hypothyroidism, which is a cause. But I would kind of go down those avenues and see if he has any of those additional symptoms. Um, and then if you do do the endocrine testing, like I said, there's many other things that can cause sweats, you know, antidepressants, um, young males, I often see with, um, androgen therapy. Sometimes they, they take their own bodybuilding or androgens. We can see sweats with that, um, or just over the counter supplements that have everything under the sun in them, caffeine, stimulants, androgens, there's supplements. So I would just make sure that you revisit kind of if he's taking anything along those lines or energy drinks or um, the new thing now is uh, like ashwagandha supplements. And I would just make sure to roll all that stuff out as well. Great, thank you. That's really helpful. Um, I had thought about few and I didn't really feel like he met clinical criteria. So I didn't order labs for that. And uh, what is could you just tell me what his med list is, Jennifer? Nothing. Is he on any? Occasional over-the-counter um, antihistamines, but but other than that, nothing. Yeah, sometimes anticholinergics can cause sweats too. Okay. Um, asthma meds are notorious for sweats, like albuterol, like inhalers can do it. Yeah. Oh, the I'll list is revisit meds but and including over-the-counter supplements and i'll ask i don't think i asked about diet i mean i might have asked about diet i did, I did a pretty complete review of systems because it was so isolated but um i'll specifically ask about diarrhea um he did not have facial blushing and um so okay well that's helpful um just because gives me a few more things to follow up on and um then I just need to keep pursuing what other possibilities there are. Yeah, I actually, so those I've are actually wondered if he has a cardiac issue because of that sort of near syncable or syncable that episode last year and then this, but he didn't have any cardiac symptoms. So, anyway, that's just my sort of my next line of um, reasoning after I follow up on some of what you said. I mean, I think if he's been bradycardic, it'd be reasonable to have him see cardiology and maybe wear a holter or have some further cardiac workup if yeah. you know he has had cardia. Yeah. Thanks. I really appreciate it. Of course. You, Dr. Of course. Okay. I'm sorry I can't find a room to go in. I'm in the hospital rounding. I apologize. I was just trying to sneak in a little cubby and I put you all in no video so <laughs> you didn't have to hear all the beat and see everything. So I apologize. We see you. I love your job. <laughs> <laughs> it's great yeah though. just you know, when you ask him those questions if you want to let us know at the next echo or you know you can always reach out to me jennifer i they can give you all my contact stuff i'm happy to help as you talk to him about the additional symptoms appreciate it sure great thank you so very much really I, appreciate it i'm sorry i can't stay on but thanks you for giving the lecture thank you all Thank you so much. Bye, Dr. G. Bye.
All right, Hugh, you can go ahead and do your um, presentation. I was just going to make one comment, Jennifer. <clears throat> My daughter um, had this happen in high school. And now she works at the Library of Congress. And anytime she was getting ready to do a presentation, she would pass out. <laughs> and they said that it, she did have low blood pressure, but I mean, blood sugar in high school is what they thought it was. But when it was happening in DC, she's actually being treated for migraines. They felt that this was a precursor to her migraines. The P and then she's actually, they put her on Indrel for uh, her to take PRN before she does a presentation or if she starts feeling panicky, which I found interesting, but it has seemed to help. She got through a whole presentation at the Library of Congress in a public venue. Wow. So it, the passing out definitely was some, something that concerned me and her mom. So I was glad they found it. And it seems like, you know, it is helping. So, so interesting. It's interesting those about the migraine well. precursor. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. Any input, you know, it doesn't have to be from Hub, Spoke, Personal. We really appreciate um, any of anybody's help. All right. Thank you so much. And thank you. Go ahead, Hugh, when you're ready. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> so for those who don't know, my name is Hugh Quinn. Um, I am a clinical pharmacist that works in Suncrest Town Center here with Dr. Giordano and the other providers um, with WVU Endocrinology. And today I'm just going to be talking a little bit about insurance coverage for our diabetic patients. So feel free to stop me along the way if you have any questions. I'll try to make sure to save some time at the end also um, for anything specific. Um, I have no disclosures to make for this presentation. Any use of brand names is just for identification purposes only. So we're going to talk a little bit about some resources that I would think may be helpful for you in your clinics when you're trying to determine coverage for patients. Um, and then we'll talk about a few specific medications and try to give some tips and provide some guidance on how to improve um, the rate of favorable outcomes with these prior authorizations for some of these more tricky uh, medications that we're commonly using in these diabetic patients. Uh, just a little bit quickly about the financial cost of diabetes. It is a very expensive medication or very expensive disease state to treat. Um, one out of every seven dollars in the U.S. that is spent on healthcare, it goes to treating diabetes and its complications. Um, so it's very expensive and quite a burden on our financial health system. And unfortunately, that uh, trend seems to only be worsening with the skyrocketing rates that we're seeing in patients that are diagnosed with diabetes. Um, and it's not just A1C when it comes to the cost of managing these patients. The uh, expense that goes towards managing the complications and comorbidities that are seen with these patients is also very expensive. So um, overall, just diabetes in general is expensive to treat. And unfortunately, with our limited resources, we have to try to use um, those resources that we have as responsible as we can. And that's where a lot of things like prior authorizations come into play. Um, so it can be a bit of a headache to navigate that system, but there is some method to the madness. Um, I certainly wish the process was a little bit easier and more streamlined, um, but there is a reason to why these rules and regulations are in place. One good place that I like to start and make people aware of is this app that you're able to download on your phone. Um, it's just called the Coverage Search app. You can get it for either Androids or Apple products from these links here. And to use, this, um, to use this app, you can see on the right here, a screenshot from it. You can type in the medication you're looking for and the state and which type of insurance, whether it's Medicare, Medicaid, or commercial insurance. And it'll give you some information on what plans um, or how plans cover that medication. So you can see on the right here, some are preferred, some are covered that require a PA or step therapy. Um, so it gives you a little bit of more information on um, where to start. This is a third party app, so it is updated pretty regularly, but it's not always 100% accurate, so keep that in mind, but it is a good place to start um, if you're trying to think about if a medication is covered for a certain patient. Other programs, I'm sure most people are probably familiar with GoodRx. It's a good, um, good resource when um, patients can use it, but there are other foundations and programs that are out there. One we've used frequently is the HealthWell Foundation. So this provides copay assistance for over 80 disease states. Um, and the eligibility is dependent on income and disease state. So different disease states have different income cutoffs. Um, and these, um, these programs are available for the individual disease state. But when the funds run out for that individual disease state, they close the program and 
you're not really sure when it'll open back up now. So the osteoporosis one has been closed for a while, um, but it does cover a lot of different disease states. Um, so this could be a good option for patients that are looking for um, additional copay assistance. Um, within this Health Well Foundation, this is an example for patients that are um, looking for copay assistance for um, dyslipidemia. You can see here what the income requirements are, 500% um, of the federal poverty level, um, and what medications that it may cover. The one thing that's nice about this program is the copay is not dependent on the medication. Like I said, it goes by disease state. So if you're treating dyslipidemia, it'll cover all the medications that are listed here for dyslipidemia. So that can be kind of nice because you're not tied to certain medications um, or certain brand products or anything like that. Medicaid is kind of fortunate where most of them have their preferred drug list pretty easily accessible online. Um, they're easy to find. So here's the links for the West Virginia, Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Ohio preferred drug list for their Medicaid patients. Um, if you just click the links here, it'll take you to the web page that has their most up-to-date. So it does change pretty frequently. Um, they've all been updated in 2023 so far. So these links will take you to the most recent pages. Um, but I just took information from those sites and sort of condensed it here for you guys um, into a little cheat sheet. Um, you can see for West Virginia, both Invocana, Forsiga, and Jardians are all preferred. Well, across the board, they're all preferred. In Maryland, the website does say that it still requires step therapy with prior metformin use, but it doesn't give um, any clinical information on what that step therapy is anymore. So I think that may be a mistake. That's just still um, an artifact of previous um, preferred drug lists. And I don't think they actually require the step therapy anymore. We'll sort of talk about why that is the case in a little bit, but um, either, any of these products are preferred um, across the board in these four states, which is nice. There are also additional saving programs that are out there, usually for commercial um, insurances only. Um, but the links are here for these, um, these companies that provide uh, copay assistance for their individual products. So you have the Janssen program for Invocana, the AstraZeneca for Farsiga, and the BI program for Jardians. Um, they do have limits on how much they will cover. Um, sometimes it's per month, sometimes it's per year, but you can get more information by clicking the links there and then going to the individual programs. This was kind of just an FYI slide I stuck in here. This is a new SGLT2 inhibitor that was approved last month, January 23rd, um, Bren Zavi or bexagliflozin. Originally, it was approved a few years ago for veterinary use, so in cats with um, diabetes, but it is now approved for use in humans um, based on the real results of this BEST trial. It does not have a cardiovascular outcome trial that's been completed yet, but they did do meta-analysis to suggest that it is safe. Um, so no increased risk of cardiovascular disease, but it doesn't have the data yet to show if it reduces the risk of cardiovascular events. But I just wanted to make everybody aware that there are in addition to the three SGLT2 inhibitors that we talked about here, there is the fourth one, or 2 glyphosin that was already on the market that's less commonly seen. Um, so that wasn't included here, but there's a fifth one now also, Renzavi. Um, so similar information here for the GLPs. Um, most commonly we see that Trulicity is a preferred medication in West Virginia, Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. I think a lot of that has to do with it having the indication for reducing risk of cardiovascular events or stroke in um, primary prevention patients. And that indication comes just from when they were doing their original trials. They had a large percentage of patients that did not have a history of events. So they were um, had 70% of patients that were primary prevention. So the FDA felt comfortable giving them that indication. Not to say that semaglutide or loreglutide or the other GLPs um, do not work in those patients, but their trials included a much lower percentage of primary prevention patients, so the FDA has not granted them that indication. So that may be one reason why some of these programs prefer to use Trulicity as their preferred medication, but um, Ozempic is now preferred in West Virginia, um, and uh, as well as Victoza that is preferred across the board also. So. We are seeing a trend that more of these are becoming um, more available through these uh, plans in different states. Uh, similarly, again, more additional savings programs for the individual products here. Um, you can get more information by clicking the links, but they um, offer copay assistance again, and they do have usually um, caps on how much they'll cover for patients. When it comes to getting GLPs um, approved, it can be a bit of a tricky process. Um, so here's just a little bit more information on the specific indications. So like I mentioned, Trulicity does have that um, indication for patients that are at risk. 
Um, so not just for secondary prevention. Um, and then another unique thing about Victoza is that it is approved for patients that are 10 years or older. So for those of us that deal with pediatric patients, um, if you think they may benefit from a GLP-1 um, therapy, uh, liraglutide is the only one that has data uh, for use in those 10 up. That is um, changing now. Semaglutide has published data. I believe it's 16 up for their patients, but we are getting more data about these agents being used in pediatric patients. Um, but I, leave, I believe as of right now, uh, liraglutide is the only one that has the indication for 10 years and older. And this is where, um, like I had mentioned, that most of the step therapy things have started to come out of plans. So a lot of the guideline recommendations, including the ACE guidelines and the ADA guidelines, have updated what they consider first-line therapy. So we can see here from the, this was from the 2022 um, ADA guidelines, um, first-line therapy now depends on comorbidity. So it used to say metformin plus lifestyle changes, but now it is um, more broad definition that it just depends on comorbidities, patient center treatment factors, including cost, access, and considerations. So what that does is open the door for us really to use SGLT2s or GLP1s as first-line therapy in those patients with compelling indica indications for those medications. So we're seeing the trend away from just metformin being first-line and then all other agents second-line and seeing more of these agents that have additional benefits beyond A1C reduction included in first-line therapy, which is nice. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about obesity too. Um, there's a lot of overlap with um, type two diabetes and obesity, uh, um, both in terms of disease state and now with the treatments that we're using. So these are the BMI cutoffs for what's defined as obesity. And I think the big thing for us is indicating, uh, or big thing for us to think about is what technically meets criteria for pharmacological treatment of obesity. So we have seen a lot of a trend for patients trying to get these GLP-1 receptor agonists, um, whether they're diabetic or not. So if they're not a diabetic patient, they are indicated if their BMI is above 30 or their BMI is above 27 and they have at least one weight-related comorbidity. So this is not an exhaustive list of weight-related comorbidities. This is just some here, but there could be many others. But if we're submitting prior authorizations, we need to make sure we are submitting the right ones that are approved for use in obesity treatment. So that we can see here really right now, we're only talking about is Saxenda and Wagovi. So if you submit a prior authorization for semaglutide 1.0 or 2.0 milligrams, and you don't specify um, that it's Wagovi for the 1.0, um, if it's Ozempic, it's gonna get denied because the patient's not a diabetic and Ozempic is not approved for obesity. So that's where one step where we can really help um, improve the probability of these medications being approved is just selecting the proper agent for the indication. Mount Jaro um, has submitted for FDA approval for treatment of obesity, but as of right now, it's not approved. Um, they're not expecting a, a decision probably until um, Q4 of this year, so towards the end of the year, but that likely will be approved eventually for obesity, but right now it's not. So the GLP that are approved for obesity right now are only Wagovi, which is semaglutide in doses of 0 0.25, um, 0 0.51, 1.7, or 2.4. So that 1.7 and 2.4 are unique to Wagovi. And Saxenda, or Liraglutide as Saxenda, um, which is available in doses up to 2.4 and 3.0, which is unique for Saxenda compared to Victoza. Um, it is still one pen, which is nice. The one Saxenda pen goes all the way up from 0 0.6 to 3.0. So that makes it easy for patients to titrate their doses. And if they don't tolerate it, they can go back down pretty easily. So that is nice, but it is a daily in, um, injection. If you're considering using medications for obesity, not for type 2 diabetes management, you can use this um, online tool and check and see if um, the medication is covered by their um, insurance. So you just put in a little bit of the patient information and then it tells you um, whether it's covered. You need to register this with a provider MPI and an email. The email that you use has to be the one that you use when you originally got your MPI, which can be um, a little difficult for some people to remember what email they were using way back then. But once you're registered, you can change it and use whatever email you want. But in the initial process, the email you use has to be the one you got when you submitted for your MPI. This is just a little bit about how to use this tool. Um, you can select the medication and put in a little bit of the patient information like we see there. Um, pharmacy name, it doesn't really matter what pharmacy you put here for most insurance companies, you can just put anything. Um, I had used Allied just for this example. 
but it gives you a little bit of information about what the estimated cost would be for this patient for um, Wigovi. And it does tell you that a prior authorization is required, but it is covered, but it does require prior authorization. Um, so this will give you a little bit more information rather than going through the prior authorization process and finding out that it's not covered at all. So it can save a little bit of time. So getting into some other medications that commonly are doing prior authorizations for in um, these patients, PCSK9s are a, a big one. Um, they are approved for secondary prevention in patients with ASCVD or for primary prevention for those with um, homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. Um, Repatha, specifically to these medications, similar to Lareglutide, um, is approved for those to 10 years of age or older. Um, the ADA recommends, recommends the use of these medications for those that are either on maximally tolerated statin or maximum dose statin or don't tolerate statins that have LDLs above 70. So I think that is the space where we are most commonly using it for patients that um, either are on the maximally dose, maximum tolerated dose of statin or don't tolerate statins at all, um, and their LDLs are still above 70, which is a fairly common thing that we see um, in our clinic at least. For these medications, um, I prefer personally to use the ACE recommended guidelines. Um, the general trend for guidelines is going more towards an LDL threshold. Um, they use LDL thresholds for a while now, and I've seen that come up more and more in other guidelines. So it's just a little bit easier for me to use, but do keep in mind that there is this extreme risk category for those with progressive ASCVD, um, those with established cardiovascular disease who have diabetes or CKD, and those with premature ASCVD. Threshold for these patients is getting pretty aggressive with minus 55. So do keep in mind that minus 70 um, is pretty aggressive for LDL, but some patients may need to get even a little bit more aggressive and seek LDLs um, less than 55. One way to help get these medications approved or something I've commonly seen in prior authorizations, um, if it's managed by Express Scripts, they've gone to some rule, which I'm not certain where it came from, um, they require a coronary artery calcification scores greater than 300 units. Um, I don't think that's supported by literature. I'm not sure how that was negotiated into their contracts, but they hang their hat on that. So they will not approve these medications if they don't have this um, requirement, um, which is pretty unfortunate. So patients need to have this test done. And if it is above 300, they'll approve it. If it's not, they won't. Um, sometimes they do not even approve the test. Um, they won't pay for the test to be done. Unfortunately, it's not very expensive test, but that's really relative. And it's a big hindrance, I think, to a lot of patients. Um, if their LDL is above 190, treated or untreated, they should be evaluated for uh, familial hypercholesterolemia. So you can use this Dutch lipid score calculator to help you out with that. Um, a lot of the questions are based on patient and family history. So it is kind of hard to do based on chart review, but if you have a patient in the room or on the phone, uh, you can get a little bit more information and see what their risk of um, having familial hypercholesterolemia is. If they score nine or higher on this score, it's definite familial hypercholesterolemia. And then they can meet the requirement for PCSK9 inhibitors based on that um, diagnosis. So it makes it easier to get approved rather than using it um, for other indications. Some insurances will take a score of six or higher, which is probable FH, then they'll approve it that way. Um, so that may be helpful for some patients. Some things that are included in this Dutch lipid score are tendon, sorry, tendon xanthomata. So if you're able to notice this on patients when you're doing physical exams or ask, it about, ask them about it, um, it gives a lot of points towards the score and can really help your chances of getting this medication approved. And the same with Arcus cornealis. So the gray bluish circle around the, the eyes here. Um, if you notice these two points in your patients, they, and they have an LDL, 190 or higher that's treated or untreated, they will have definite um, FH. So they will meet the criteria for those medications. Another medication that I've seen some issues with with prior authorizations in the past is Vasipa. So relatively new, it's been out for a few years now. Historically, it was used for hypertriglyceridemia. So triglycerides over 500, but more recently it was approved for um, cardiovascular risk reduction in type two diabetics that have risk factors and triglycerides over 150. These are two separate indications for the FDA. So if you're submitting um, to an insurance company and you say it's for hypertriglyceridemia and their triglycerides are not over 500, it's gonna be denied. Even if they meet the criteria for the other indication, so they're type twos, they have risk factors and a triglyceride, say 250. 
um, that is indicated for those patients, but it's not for hypertriglyceridemia. So different insurance companies have different wording on things. So we just need to be careful when we're filling out the prior authorizations forms so that we're selecting the right indication for these patients. Um, a little bit about step therapy, um, I think is important to note. When we say maximally tolerated statin, that can be no statin. So if a step therapy or if an indication mentions that a patient must be on maximally tolerated statin, that does not mean they cannot have the medication if they're not on a statin. So no statin can be appropriate still. Um, when we're talking about intensities of statin, so a lot of insurances will require a trial of a high intensity statin. So that we're specifically talking about Resuva 20 to 40, or a torvastatin 40 to 80. So it does not account a high dose of simvastatin or the highest dose of pravastatin or anything like that. So a high intensity statin has to be one of these two um, medications at these doses. And then a lot of times commonly we see included in the step, ther step therapy is Zetia or Zetamide. It is a good medication, generally pretty well tolerated with an expected LDL reduction of about 12 to 17%. For a lot of patients, that might not be enough, enough to get them below that threshold of 70 or 55, whichever is appropriate. Um, if a patient's threshold is 70 and their LDL is 170, Zetia is not going to get them there. Some insurances will allow you to skip Zetia and go right to a PCSK9 if you're able to demonstrate that it's not going to be effective enough to get them below their threshold. Some are more stringent on it than others that will require you to use the Zetia for three or six months show again that they're still not at threshold before you go on to the PCSK9 inhibitor. Bempadoc acid is a newer medication that's out. It hasn't really shown up in step therapies yet, but it is a useful uh, medication, I think, to be considering um, before you go to PCSK9 inhibitors. It is a daily oral medication, which is nice. It is a prodrug that's only active in the liver or activated in the liver. Um, not the muscle tissue. So we see a lot less of the muscle pain and myalgias than we would with our statins, even though we're working in the same pathway here to prevent the synthesis of cholesterol. So it works in the same pathway as statins, but it's only activated in the liver, so we get less side effects. Um, and we get a pretty robust LDL reduction with this medication of about 18%, which it does come combined in one pill with zetamide called Nexplazet. So with one additional pill, you're getting two medications and you can expect about a 38% reduction in LDL, um, which is nice. So in patients, maybe they don't wanna do the injections or aren't uh, able to afford PCSK9 inhibitors, maybe bempadoic acid either by itself or with Zetia might be an option for those patients. And it does have a copay card also for those that are commercially insured. Um, and then here is just an example of what um, some of the requirements might look like when you're looking for some of these medications. So this one is for bempadoic acid from the West Virginia Medicaid. Um, this is what they would require a patient to meet all age and indication restrictions imposed by FDA on the group label. So that is adults. Um, and this is the other criteria. So they have to have an eight week trial of a high intensity statin plus Zetia and not below an LDL of 70. Um, so they require an eight week trial of either one of those combinations before they'll approve bempadoc acid. Then they'll have an initial approval uh, for 90 days, which you'll need to submit um, a new LDL and show that it has lowered by at least 10% before, before they'll um, cover additional therapy. But um, with um, an expected LDL reduction of about 18%, um, I think most patients will meet that 10% threshold. Uh, this is still somewhat of a bit of a newer medication. I'm sure most of us that work in the endocrine world have heard a lot about it um, and seen a lot about it in social media, but Mount Jaro or Terzepatide. Um, they did put out an announcement yesterday that the shortage is over for this. Apparently it is widely available at all doses now. So that's good to hear, but we'll see what actually happens um, at the ground level in pharmacies. Um, but they do have a copay card also where it's $25 for a one or three month supply. Um, if you use this medication. Again, it's not approved yet for obesity, so it is only approved for type 2 diabetes. Um, so keep that in mind. There is more data coming out about the use of GLP-1s in type 1 diabetes. Um, so keep an eye out for that too. Um, it is somewhat sometimes used off-label in patients. Um, I think a lot of that is for the weight loss component of it, but um, currently none of these GLPs are approved for type 1 diabetics, but there is um, some ongoing research into that field. Another thing I wanted to talk about and getting a few questions about now that it's the new year is the Inflation Reduction Act. So those patients that have Medicare Part D, 
Insulin is capped at a $35 fee for a one month supply. So this is active now. So if a patient was charged more, um, there is a way to get reimbursed. Um, they have uh, 45 days to get reimbursed for that. So if anyone complains that they've been being charged more, um, they can look into that. But anyone with Part D um, or Part B also, if they are on pumps um, starting July 1st, uh, it'll also be capped at $35. And that was all I had for you guys today. Are there any questions for me? Thank you so very much. That was wonderful. And you provided some really excellent resources. We'll make sure everybody has. But yeah, anybody have any questions or comments? I have a question. Yep. Um, if we have a patient that was on Mount Jaro in 2022 and the rules and regs are now requiring uh, prior authorization to continue therapy. I don't know if you're seeing that in your area. We're having problems getting through the prior authorization process because their um, their A1Cs are low, and they're kind of you know pushing back on the medical necessity angle. Yeah, we've had some programs that were nice enough to grandfather it in. Um, like for the year or something like that, but some have outright denied it now. Some are also putting in like an A1C must be above seven to approve GLPs in general, which I don't know where that's coming from. That's not supported by data or literature at all and goes against what the ADA and ACE guidelines are that regardless of A1C, if they have cardiovascular risk, they should be on these medications. So that is something we are seeing more. Um, and I'm not really sure how to navigate around that yet. We've had patients where we're happy because their A1C is now below seven at like 6.8 or 6.7. So we try to start them on a new medication or, or raise their dose and they're being told no by their insurance company. So exactly, um, they're being punished for being successful, which does not make sense to me at all. Um, I wish I had more tips on how to get around that, but this time I don't, sorry. Okay. Thank you very much for that question. Anybody else have any questions or comments? We had a participant uh, reach out to us and I can ask this question, just throw it out there for anyone um, who might have some sort of comment, not necessarily an answer or anything, but um, I'll go ahead and just ask it anyway, if anyone does have some feedback. But um, she was asking um, how your facilities successfully incorporate behavioral health patients who have diabetes um, and then sort of a follow-up to that is, is there a specific tool and does this include using, and my apologies, I don't know what this stands for, but SDOH tool already built into the EHR um, and or questions sent out via the patient portal ahead of the patient appointment time. So I know that's kind of a long-winded question. Um, no pressure if no one has any concrete answers to this, but any feedback or comments to that would be great. It's not something I'm very familiar with with the process at our clinic, but I can look into it and then maybe send out some more information afterwards. Yeah, that would be awesome. And we could even, you know, bring this question up again at the next session. Maybe some of the other hub members might be on as well. Maybe they'll have some feedback to it as well, but Thank you. And Donna, I saw you unmuted. Did you have a comment about I that? I just wanted to tell you the SDOH is social determinants of health. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Donna. That helps a lot. So Great. those are things like, can they afford their medicine? Do they have transportation? Um, are they safe at home? Things like that. Right, right. Absolutely. No, that definitely makes a lot more sense for my, <laughs> my own understanding. I appreciate that, Donna. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, so we'll do our poll. I'll make the final announcement. Um, just give me one moment, please. These are just going to be monthly, even though we just meet monthly, but just for our It was record. nice to see you all. You too. And our next session will be on March 22nd with Jennifer Turner discussing testosterone replacement. But yeah, once you finish, you can hop off. Thank you so much for joining us today.